So today we're going to talk about the FRC software layout. And this is pretty complicated in terms of the number of uh, different software packages interacting with one another. So you, you may watch this once or twice to really appreciate this. But um, a lot of the software we are given, so we don't have to worry about things too much, but I find that a lot of the teams don't really understand um, all the underlying inner workings of what's going on. So we're going to talk about that today. So uh, first, uh, I'll just say that I'm going to be speaking about the uh, Java implementation mostly, but if you are using uh, National Instruments, uh, the LabVIEW, or the Wind River C++ compiler, that uh, most of this is still true, but some of the aspects of this you won't be that interested in. So uh, first, let's just look at the big picture. So we have a, 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 the device called the CRIO2. It's the second model. They have previously had a larger model that had more slots. Um, but this one now is, is, uh, has a single Ethernet, uh, a simpler power connection, uh, no switches. They used to have switches here, and um, fewer slots. Inside of this hardware, though, it's a slightly better processor, slightly newer, and a uh, much newer FPGA. And an FPGA is a uh, signal processor, and, and so you don't you don't program that directly on our team. But we we'll, can talk about that more later. But the FPGA is what really provides the connectivity to these slots. So on this on this hardware, the underlying software that runs first is Linux. And it, it uses a version of Linux called VxWorks. This is, I, I believe, is proprietary, and it's it's a real-time operating system. Uh, real-time operating systems compared to what you you will use on your desktop uh, have assurances in the code that code will execute timely. So there are certain aspects where uh, if something's running and it, it, the code hangs, uh, the operating system will force it out of that and uh, find ways to continue running. Uh, you'll see VxWorks running all over the place. This is a great piece of software to get to know in industry. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of jobs connected to uh, to it. Now, I'll say, though, that VxWorks itself doesn't update that often. And, and the reason why is, is we like stability in the configuration. We're not necessarily looking for the latest and greatest features in something like VxWorks. We're making, we want to make sure that it works for when we build a new device. And that's that's why you see it used. Uh, running under uh, running on VxWorks is for us uh, something called the Squawk Java Virtual Machine, and and I have to tell you this isn't my favorite piece of software uh, because it's got some limited features. But the reason where it came from is uh, Sun originally, and and then they were bought by Oracle. Uh, their research lab had had an interesting question. Uh, they said, "Can we write a, a Java?" virtual machine in Java. And, and if you're not familiar, a Java virtual machine is the piece of software on your computer that runs Java code. And, and so if you think about that for a second, it's a piece of Java software built to run Java software. So you have to give them some credit. That, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, and I'm, I'm sure it's not in, you know easy. It's definitely a, a chicken or the egg. And there are some parts of Squawk that are not written in Java, I'm sure. Um, you know, you just have to somewhere bootstrap it to, to do that. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's very strange. Uh, you know, and, and I think they were looking for use for the software. And honestly, I think that's why I ended up uh, in using you know, here in the uh, FRC code. So we, we don't get to build Squawk. Squawk is provided for us. And I actually once emailed the guy, and, and he said that on their public website, they don't even post all the files to actually build to build it uh, you know, thoroughly. And they don't provide any documentation on how to build it. I, I did once look into uh, trying to get some of that and build it myself so that we could add in extra features with it. But you know, it just didn't happen because they weren't willing to provide it. So on top of the, you know, the, this Squawk, and inside of Java, uh, still, there are some FRC-provided executable stuff. And, and 
you know, I'm not really sure where the where the line is drawn in here. You know, um, that's why I left uh, no white space in between here. But but there's some FRC stuff that they provide us, and that deals with like network communication and and some assurances there um, that it will work with the field and, and things like that. So uh, that code runs, and we're, we're so we are given all of all of this. You know, I haven't talked about these other softwares yet, but everything down here we're given. And I can't erase. So uh, now let's talk about though about what we build. Um, it everything that we code on our team turns into uh, uh, FRC uh, user program dot out. And so your Java is you know uh, compiled into bytecode in this in this file here and I'll show you where that goes on their on their uh, uh, file system later but everything we do is right here and that's all we get to do and so everything about moving that you know controlling the Jaguars uh, what what should happen in autonomous uh, you know interacting with the driver station and reading joystick values all of that happens right here and that's the only and that's the only code we uh, work on Additionally, I'll just point out that there's some other libraries and things on the FRC or on the uh, uh, Rio that runs. Such things are the division software. There's an FTP server and a uh, www server, and you can actually, you know, at our computers in the lab, you can interact with these. The FTP server, of course, is what we use uh, to connect and upload our code, so that's why we have an FTP server. The World Wide Web server stuff is mostly there, I believe, just for NI, for some configuration issues. We don't really use that you know, in what we do. Um, and, you know, there's plenty more software, and I'm not going to go into the specifics. And I won't even pretend that I know it all either. But, you know, this kind of gives you the big picture of, of what's going on. So let's, let's take a break from that and look at NetBeans. So uh, NetBeans is the program that we use to, uh, you know, write and compile our code for the robot. And so I'm assuming already that you can download NetBeans and install the plugin. There are uh, six plugins that you install for the FRC code. Um, so under the install setting, you can see I have a robot templates, a rename factoring, a Java info, a Squawk SDK, a application template, and FRC command templates. So a couple of these are just for starting out the templates. The Java info and rename factoring are all probably just for niceties in, in NetBeans for us as users. And FRC Squawk, though, is, is where the meat is. So we're going to take a look at that more closely uh, right now. So you'll download these and install them. And if there's an update, you'll see the updates here. Maybe only once during the competition, maybe twice, will you see an update. So when we look at the file system, when, we, when you download the plugins and you uh, get them installed, uh, you'll notice a new directory. So under your uh, users, uh, your user account, and then there's a directory called Sunspot FRC uh, SDK uh, that gets installed. Now it may not be under users, it may be under um, documents and settings if you're under a different version of Windows, but this folder will get created. Uh, under your account that you install it on. Under here are several directories that we're going to pay attention to. One is ant, uh, bin for binary, uh, serial, which doesn't have much in it, but I'll show it to you. Serial images, this one's important. Docs for documentation, lib for library, also important. And platform specific and SRC, we're going to ignore. There's not as much uh, useful stuff in here. So let's take a look at ant. Now, Ant is a program in, in Java written for building Java files. And so what you're seeing here are uh, some executable Ant code, some support code, uh, and a lot of XML files. And so what Ant does is Ant is a make program. So when we have a project in NetBeans and you hit build, uh, NetBeans isn't the thing that actually is, you know, choosing how to build the the code. That's Ant. Uh, so NetBeans calls Ant for us, and there's a lot of different XML files in here that you can look up the specific steps that it's doing. So let's take a look in Compile, for example. I'm just going to open it with WordPad. 
which is not a great editor, but it's what I have on this computer. <clears throat> so you you know it's all XML. That's where you're going to see tags like this. Um, there's a you know do compile, and it lists out the steps and the settings, for example, of how to build your code. So it's while I'm, I'm just pointing this out, it's not necessarily that interesting. There are some interesting things that you may notice though about. Um, when it comes to uploading the code, there's a, uh, let me see if I remember, mm, it's probably in upgrade. So, you know, in, even in addition to everything I'm going to talk to you about, um, there's uh, stuff on here about how to, you know, make sure that uh, the CRIO is up to date. There's another little uh, program that uh, NetBeans uploads called OTA, and I think what they mean there is over the air. I'm not 100% sure on their acronym used there, but uh, it's an over the air server, which is, I think, their way of, um, uh, I believe, connecting to, uh, you know, ensure configuration. And that's uh, what I mean by that is. Um, the, the NetBeans uh, connection, all right, well, let me start over. Uh, so uh, the over-the-air server, uh, I believe, runs on the CRIO. So when you, when you uh, compile a program in uh, NetBeans and then you know, have it upload to the robot, it checks the OTA server version. And what that does is, um, I believe, it allows the... Uh, the serial connection between NetBeans and the CRIO. And what I mean by that is after you hit run on the NetBeans, so it uploads the code, the, when the CRIO reboots, you'll be actually looking at the console output of the CRIO, almost as if you were sitting you know, at the computer and you're seeing the console output uh, of the system. And so I, I believe that's what the OTA server does. So uh, under uh, Sunspot FRC SDK again, let's go look under bin. So there is not as much interesting stuff in here, but I will point out uh, some support uh, executables. There's a pre-verify, a ROMer, ROMizer classes, Squawk, Squawk device classes. Okay, so when you build an executable for Squawk, uh, so you're, you've written it in Java and you've compiled it, if you've made any sort of uh, what I call system calls, uh, where you're using certain uh, uh, packages, um, pre-verify is something to verify that you know. Pre-verify is, is is some code uh, checks to make sure that your executable links correctly. I, I believe that's what that does. There's a ROMizer, which I believe here is read-only memory. And it's making it so that your program uh, can call uh, read-only memory, makes those calls correctly. And I would assume for security purposes that your code should be treated as read-only memory. If, if you have an executable that you can write to, uh, that opens up a world of, you know, can of worms of security problems. So I could try to overwrite my own code or overwrite someone else's code and then get the system to do what I want it to do. I, I mean, obviously, that's a little bit out of the scope of uh, FRC, you know, during the competition. But um, this is something that on their end they have to check, anyways. And then here's some Squawk and Squawk device classes. So if we, you know, jar files are actually they're a lie. It, it's a zip file, and you can open them up. But if if we did, you would notice there's just some uh, Java executables. I don't even know if Windows probably won't let me easily open this on this computer, but I could open it with like 7-zip and show it to you. So there's some binaries there. CRIO, uh, what we notice here is the... Um, so squawk out is the executable. Squawk.suite, I believe, provides uh, some of the library, you know, internal support for squawk. This is an internal thing for the executable. There's a suite.metadata, and I believe this is uh, useful information when you build programs that need to use the suite. So think of these as being the, uh, the binary, uh, you know, actual commands the CRIO runs. 
but when it comes to building a program you have to link against an executable and so in this case they use a metadata to do that correctly and then here's our FRC user program .l. this is something that they just provide I guess is, is like a you know a bare bones template or something on the robot um, but so the one you build will, will be different in this exact file and it will usually be about four megs this is much smaller so that's what's under Cereal. Now Cereal images is, is kind of interesting. You'll see two files. I've already extracted the zip file, but um, FRC 2011 uh, version 28, FRC 2012 version 43. So you'll notice the size. It's about 50 megs, uh, you know, decompressed. And so in the zip file are, you know, these these folders. There's a Cereal common, a Cereal FRC, Cereal FRC2. So, uh, quick observation one is on either Cereal hardware, this folder gets extracted, Cereal common. If you have a Cereal 1, the old version, this folder also gets extracted. If you have a Cereal 2, uh, this folder also gets extracted. Let's take a look. So, if we connect it in on the FTP server, uh, to the Cereal, we would see this folder NIRT, National Instruments, Real Time. You know, under here, System. What you're seeing on here, VXWorks. All right, so here's some Linux, you know, operating system. Notice that it's not that large. You know, interestingly enough, right? You you compile it to be bare bones. You want it to be fast. There's a bunch of .out files. .out files you can think of uh, as .exe files running on the uh, Cereal. It's just they chose that extension just because. There's some uh, LV bit X. Uh, I'm thinking that that's LabVIEW, you know, bit, and uh, I don't know what the X is there. Maybe extended or something. That's probably something that they just like. But notice what they are though. It's a FPGA code. So what what really happens is. Um, the actual code that runs on the FPGA is given to us, uh, and, and this, you know, the Serial Imaging tool, pretty, I'm sure, just takes this file, and uh, I would say, you know, uploads it into the FPGA. So the FPGA, the way it works, it's, it's a field programmable gate array, and. Uh, based on how there's sort of a, 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 a gate array in there, this is you know the technical term, but think of it as a mesh of uh, connections, you know, light switches, and you can turn them on and off. And uh, it's, it's it's you know for a a local group of on-off switches, if you turn them, you know, if you set them to a certain setting, it'll be an adder. So you have two signals coming in and one going out, it'll add. Uh, if you have a different set of light switches. For two signals coming in, it'll be a subtraction. You can do this for many forms of binary operations, and that's really what the FPGA does. And we like it because it, we can reprogram it on the fly. So rather than have dedicated hardware that's specifically for an ad, and that's all it can do, uh, we we build everything into an FPGA, and then we can you know modify it on the run later. FPGAs have a lot of really powerful and very fast signal processing capabilities. It's really kind of sad that we don't get to work with them more so, that they don't uh, open that code up for us. There are probably some really good reasons why they don't do that. Uh, I will say right now that FPGAs are not necessarily easy to work with, especially you know without the background in them. However, me as a signal processing guy, really like them, and I really wish we could use them more. We, you know, and what, I wish we could even just request features from them just to throw in there, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> So, and then if you're using the Black Jaguar in CAN mode, they have even executable for that. All right, so I've spoken a lot about that. Let's back out. Now I'm going to look at uh, the common. So we have some more stuff. And notice we have a vision directory, not a whole lot in it. But if you go into the real time under, I believe, not startup, under system, we see some really good stuff in here. So notice that there are a lot of dot out files. You even have some folders with some other stuff, but uh, a lot of doubt out files. And I'll pay attention to uh, FRC network communication. This is a one of the pieces of code that they give us that we don't get to modify that deals with ensuring that our robot uh, communicates correctly with the field. 
So everything we do in our uh, Java is uh, any outbound communication. Somehow this ensures that it's uh, uh, correct and that we don't get to modify it. Uh, and, and I think they do that just for uh, configuration to make sure that we should be compatible with a field system. So there's uh, plenty of other executables, a lot of NI for national instrument stuff. I, I thought the vision stuff was in here, but maybe it's actually in the specific. Let me go take a look real quick because I'd like to point that out. So I'll look in FRC2 this time. Oh, yeah, so I did miss it. So there's there's your NI vision library. Now this is about five megs of binary. And I think there's a vision service, and I think this is the piece of software that you interact with. And the underlying hardware, or excuse me, yeah, the underlying uh, fast implementation of vision, vision processing routines is in this code here. Okay. So uh, that's kind of, you know, an overview of what's in uh, Cereal images. Let's go back. Doc. Okay, this folder is important. Java doc. And we can look at index. Uh, Java doc is everything we can do in our Java code. If there, if it is not in this documentation, we cannot use it. And uh, so you may be familiar with in your Java programming class at school some libraries that um, you have on your desktop Java implementation, which is called Java SE. Uh, on the uh, robot, we do not have Java SE, we have Java ME for micro edition. I should say that Java SE, I believe, is just standard edition. So, once again, if it's not in this documentation, we cannot use it. It does not exist on Squawk. So, there's you know, there's some ups and downs to that. Um, uh, there's things inside of Squawk. Uh, wrong one. Maybe it's under Squawk IO. Okay, so there's stuff like buffered reader, buffered writer. These deal with how to write files on the file system. And if you go on your computer and write some Java code to read a file and you know do something or write a file, uh, it's a little more straightforward. We know how to. We've seen some example code to get the things like reading a file and writing a file uh, on on the Squawk virtual machine. It is not necessarily straightforward. I don't think I would come up with it on my own. I, I think that they're uh, a little strange in their implementation. I think, it, and that's probably in just because uh, Java, everything has to be a class. And so these guys think of everything in terms of classes, and they have new classes for everything, as opposed to just making stuff a little more straightforward. Uh, but squawk.util has things like arrays. Uh, hash table vector. So these these are data types that would be a little bit easier to get to uh, outside, you know, in Java SE. But unfortunately, we have some squawk setbacks. So, anyways, I don't want to belabor this. You can read through this code um, documentation. Uh, everything that we can do on our robot is in here, and this is you know it's critical to know what your tools are if if you go into a shop and you don't know what you know that you have a hammer and you need a hammer um, you, you know you, it really restricts what you can do right so everything in here we kind of have to know or at least be familiar with so feel free to click around and figure it out then under lib this is another really good directory to talk about uh, all the documentation that you just saw this is the code in here for, that actually does uh, everything in that documentation. So you know, it's a lot of directories, but um, if you want to access the code that deals with a counter, deals with a Jaguar, deals with a joystick, all of that code is right here. And one of the really nice things about them giving us this is we can modify it. So we are not really bounded by the WPI lib directly. So if we want to change how we handle a joystick or change a little, you know, small stuff like that, totally doable. And it's actually a lot of fun. So this is very extendable for us and we need and we every year since I've been a part of the team take advantage of it and we'll continue to do so. Okay. So that kind of wraps up uh, you know, the directories I want to talk about here. So I'm going to go back to this picture. All right. So we talked about VXWorks, we talked about Squawk, we talked about the FRC provided code, 
talked about where your code and how it connects into all that code and all their existing software that they give us. And I'm just going to close out with a few uh, comments. There are several programming websites. I'm not including the actual URL in the video, but you can just Google for these. Uh, there's GitHub. We use that every day in, in during build season. There is Chief Delphi, which we use pretty routinely, maybe not every day. There is First Forge at WPI, and WPI is a school, if you're not familiar, that provides a lot of software to uh, the FRC teams, including WPI Lib, uh, for free. So we're very thankful for them. Uh, they give us job updates. There is the National Instruments website, which uh, has the computer software updates and the lab view updates and so on. And, and then there's a Squawk FRC website, and we don't go there often, if at all. But I just wanted to point it out for the really adventurous that it does exist, and you can go look at it. All right, final closing out comments. To update the CRIO software or the FPGA image, you know, the all that stuff, actually physically on the CRIO that runs, we use the CRIO imaging tool. You use that mostly just once per update, and we may only have one or two updates during the season. Then, to upload our robot code, we use NetBeans IDE. This is something we use every day during build season, and we upload code uh, around the clock. You know, as soon as you make a change, you upload it, you try it out, make sure it works. To change our driver station dashboard, which sometimes we do, uh, we use the National Instruments LabView software. And so that's the actual uh, uh, dashboard. We don't get to change the driver station. That they give us, and there's nothing we can do. But the dashboard uh, reads out information from the robot, and we have changed that, including last year uh, adding in the vision uh, code and whatnot. And then to track our software code changes, we use Git and Smart Git. Uh, Git is the command line. It's a uh, it's a very nice, robust tool. Smart Git is a nice little GUI front end for Git. We use that at least once a day, uh, if not more, to you know upload our code changes to GitHub, which is the website, and then pull up the changes from each other's computers on there. And so with that, I'm going to close out.